Well, good morning, everybody. We're glad you're here joining us today. It's actually good to look out and see everybody here on a holiday weekend. Good to know I'm not the only one who lacks the friends to invite me to their cabin for the weekend. So, um, uh, Before we get started, I wanted to add my, my goodbye and my thanks to the Huber family. Um, we really have enjoyed having you here for these years. And, one of the things that I very much appreciated about you and your family is you have a very big vision of God. Uh, as anytime I would talk to Sam, he would talk about all these different things that he's involved in, whether it's you know something over at Jeremiah Tree, or whether it is getting together with different pastors and this this outreach that he's wa- wanting to plan. And I'm thinking. You don't have the time to do all of these things. But he found the time. He made the time. He had this great vision of who God was, and he knew that it was worth investing all that he had to do it. And if only more of us had a vision of God like that, imagine the difference that we can all make in this world. And uh, and, and another thing was just as we... Uh, recently saw a whole bunch of people come and join the church. A bunch of them were college students. And without fail, a number of them said one of the reasons they were connected to our church was because of Sam and Kim and their investment in them and taking them in and taking them under their wing and, and discipling them and loving on them. And so that is an amazing thing and. uh, the church that you're going to is, is gaining something, and it's our loss. Um, but we know the kingdom of God will be greater for it. So, um, yeah, I pray you sell that house, too. So, well, again, uh, welcome. Uh, we are continuing in our series on Second Timothy that we are calling in the, the Unstoppable God and... and the unstoppable life. Um, you've made it halfway. We are halfway through the book already. Um, so not much further to go. And it, those of you who haven't been a part of it from the beginning, um, just a, a quick little recap. This is a book of Paul writing to his protege, Timothy, kind of at the end of Paul's life. He is nearing the end of his ministry. He is waiting in Rome, waiting for his execution. And he's writing this letter to Timothy in the midst of some difficult times of the church that he's pastoring there in Ephesus. And the whole idea of this book is to encourage Timothy to keep going to be unstoppable in the midst of what's going on. And there are these recurring themes in the book. Paul's telling Timothy to to know where you are in life, to evaluate your circumstances and know what's going on. And here's Paul. He knows what's going on. He knows he's about to be executed. Timothy knows what's going on, that he's in this difficult situation in his church, He's about to lose his mentor. And those are just important realities to be aware of. But Paul also tells Timothy to put life in the right framework, to to know where you're going and what you're doing and to understand what reality is in spite of the things going on around you. He also tells Timothy to get his identity right, to know who you are and know whose you are and what you have been called to do, and that's another thing that Paul is telling him, to to keep your purposes clear. And then lastly, and a recurring theme in this, is to draw upon the right resources. To know that you have resources beyond things, but you have the Holy Spirit who lives within you, who empowers you, You have God's word, which 
certainly for them, was still being written at the time. But he had those truths that he could draw upon and to turn to in the midst of things so that he can put all of these things in the right perspective. And so you hear this throughout the book, to hold fast, to take what you've learned and pass it on, to endure hardship. Last week we heard uh, Pastor Greg talk about that he needs to stay focused on what he's called to do. And so today we are going to talk about, here in chapter 3, this idea of understanding the times that you're in. To know what to expect and to plan for it. So if you wouldn't mind, if you have your scriptures, if you have your Bible, open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to look at the first nine verses. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, and I'm going to read out of the NIV. And it says this, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, Brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men opposed the truth, men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected. But they will not get very far, because, as in the case of those men, Their folly will be clear to everyone. Pray with me before we jump in. Father, we come before you this morning uh, grateful for who you are, that we can come and worship you, that we can be together as a body of believers to look into your word and to see how it is relevant to us today. And even as we read these words in this passage, (laughs) it is almost like it is pulling things out of the headlines. It is describing this world perfectly. And so clearly we should take that as just an indicator that there is something that you have for us today. And so God, speak to us through your word. God, may my words be your words, and help us as your people uh, to humbly take what you have to say to us and allow it to penetrate our hearts so that we can become more like Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. So here we are in, in... chapter 3, and it's coming right off of the heels of Paul's charge to Timothy there at the end of chapter 2 to stay focused. And the first thing he says in all of this is, don't be surprised. And so if you have your your notes there and you're following along, uh, the first point in that is, don't be surprised. And the notes that I have up here on the screen will be from the New Living Translation, which I just thought might be a little bit easier for us to kind of, to pull out and gain a little bit of understanding of what the passage is saying. But he says here, 
you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Now this is at least the fifth time in this small book already that Paul brings up the idea of hardship or persecution or difficult times. So clearly he wants to get it through to to Timothy's head that difficult times come with the job of being a Christian leader. This time, after he tells him to stay focused, after he tells Timothy to pursue character and have compassion on those who might challenge his leadership, he immediately says that Timothy should know that it's coming. He had just said in the the previous passage that Timothy should gently instruct those who would oppose him and that in doing so he should hope that those people would come to repentance. But even though there's going to be opposition, he says, let me be clear on this. There will be difficult times. Some of our our translations say terrible times. He says, hard times, they are coming. And the church, that's you and I, we need to be aware of this fact too. Timothy in particular, as a pastor of the church of Ephesus, really needs to know this, as I'm sure he is, as he's dealing with false teachings and other things in the church. But he's saying, don't be caught off guard. Don't be surprised. You don't need to be afraid that these hard times are coming. You don't need to question whether or not God is in control. Because he still is. You don't need to question whether or not you're doing the right thing in being faithful. Because you are. But you do need to prepare for them. We need to be diligent. We need to be watchful and prudent and faithful. Hard times are coming. But he also says this. He says that they're coming here in the last days. Now, Paul isn't making some prediction about some far-off time in the future. Although, as we read it, it sounds like we're reading about today, so it could have been some far-off time 2,000 years later. But he's not making some prediction about the times that are just only immediately preceding the second coming of Christ. And he's not necessarily talking about the times of tribulation that we expect these hard times to be there. See, the verses that follow make it clear that Timothy is living in these last days. In fact, the last days are already upon him. Otherwise, he wouldn't say later to avoid such people who are doing these things. But the last days that are upon us is a clear and consistent teaching throughout the New Testament. If you look in chapter 2 of Acts, and this is here on the day of Pentecost, and, and Peter is quoting the book of Joel, and he says this, he says, In the last days, God's spirit, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. And we saw that that happened there in Acts chapter 2. And in Hebrews chapter 1, it says, Long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these last days he has spoken to us through his son. And this idea is carried through in the book of James chapter James chapter 5 and 2 Peter chapter 3. The New Testament authors make it clear that the last days are the period between Christ's first coming 
and his still future second coming. In other words, the church age that we're currently living in is a part of the last days. And if we're living in this, this is what we should expect. We should expect hard times. And if we need to expect them, then we need to be prepared for the hardship and the suffering that is associated with these last days. Just a little bit later on in this chapter, of chapter 3, verse 12, even Paul warns that all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So the first thing he says here is don't be surprised. Expect it. They're coming. But then the next thing he says is watch out. This is what to look for. What will these difficult times look like? Well, here's the, the, that, those verses again in the New Living Translation. It says, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. In these verses, we see no less than 18 different vices or sins that will be evident of terrible times in the last days. I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time expounding on what every sin on this list means because for most of them, they're pretty self-explanatory. I think we understand what it means to be ungrateful and what it means to be proud and but it does seem like these are things that are, are perfectly ripped from today's world. It's almost like anything we see on YouTube or social media or, or just the news fits every single one of these things. And it's significant to notice, I think, that the first two... Lovers of themselves and lovers of money. And the last one, love pleasures rather than lovers of God, are talking about a love that is wrongly directed. A love that is pointed in the wrong direction. You know, self-love may be regarded as a source from which all the other sins and all the other vices follow. A person who loves himself claims a superiority in everything and despises all others. A person who loves himself is often cruel and is unforgiving, and so on and so on. But you might say, you know what? You know, didn't I read a verse somewhere that says that, you know, we should love our neighbor as ourself? So isn't it saying that I should love myself? Well, that's a, a little bit of a twisting of what that is getting at there. Because, you know, we, we might try and justify this idea that, that, you know, we just need to love ourselves properly. Because if you don't love yourself properly, then you can't love God and others. Right? I've heard, I've heard that argument being said. But the Bible is really clear that the root problem that we all have is that we love ourselves too much. It's what leads to our sin. What are the great commandments? They're to love God and to love, other, to love your neighbor, to love other people. And as we say here at EBC, it's to honor God and to love people. And in the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, 
the self-love is assumed is the assumed standard by which we can measure if we really do love others. In other words, if you and I have the same concern for others that we have toward ourselves, then we, then we would fulfill that commandment to love other people. See, the, the biblical mark of love is not how much we love ourselves so that we can love others, but the biblical mark of love is self-sacrifice. Not self-love and not a great self-esteem. So do we remember what Jesus said? Jesus said that if we want to follow him, we need to deny ourselves. We need to take up his cross daily, take up our cross daily, and follow him. He doesn't say that we need to work on a better self-love. There are many verses in the Bible that, that command us to be humble and to think rightly about ourselves, to not think too highly of ourselves, which is what our, our tendency is, is, is to do. Is we tend to think too highly of ourselves. But there are no verses in Scripture at all that tell us that we need to love ourselves more. And there are no Scriptures that tell us that we need to esteem ourselves more higher than we already do. More higher. Is that right? That's not right. Anyway, you know what I mean. Our text warns us here that self-love heads the list of all manner of, of the different evils that face us. But it seems interesting to me that what Paul describes as the type of behavior that make up terrible times is not what most of us would think of as terrible. See, if, if I were to hear somebody say, you know what, you need to expect terrible times are coming, I would be thinking in my mind, oh man, there's going to be things like war and famine or disease, or persecution, or things like that. But instead, Paul gives us this list of the things that we experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's giving a list of things that we experience as I said already, on YouTube and TikTok and our social media and our news cycles and, and even in our own entertainment. Rather than giving us a list of terrible external things that we might experience, the Holy Spirit through Paul gives us a list of things that describe the wicked and depraved hearts of men and women. You know, I think in some ways, because we're exposed to these things all the time, that we, we become a little desensitized to how bad they really are. So I, I, I did this. I tried to sit down and think through this connection between terrible times, difficult times, and this list of sins. Because when I look at this list, I think I'm watching these things on TV and I find them entertaining. I don't think of them as terrible times. So what's the connection I need to make here? Well, John Calvin put it this way. He said... Nothing is so distressingly painful to godly men and to those who truly fear God as to behold such corruption of morals. 
For as there is nothing which they value more highly than the glory of God, so they cannot but suffer grievous anguish when it is attacked or despised. In other words, when our highest value is to see God honored and to see him glorified above all else, it is a terribly difficult thing to see people living lives inconsistent with that value. And if it's not, if it's not a difficult thing when we see people living lives inconsistent with that, then what does that say about us? And so when I put it that way, when I think the reason these things should be distressful or terrible or difficult is I kind of had to ask myself, do I really value God's glory that much? When I look at my own life and I see the things that I find to be funny or entertaining or the things that I turn to just in my everyday life, does it break my heart? Now, I find it difficult to go through my day when these are the things that I see all the time. And sadly, far too often, that's not the thing. It doesn't break my heart. And I was so convicted by that this week. You know, I was, I was tempted to go through each one of these things and kind of put up a picture of, of all the things in our society that match those. You know, lovers of money, and you know, that could be the Kardashians, or, or actually, you know, everything on the list could be the Kardashians. But um, not to pick on one family that I don't even know. But, but reality is, if I had done that, rather than a picture of them, there would have been a picture of me. And how much that I value my own financial security than I value loving God. Or how much I often will talk about my own self and the things that I've been able to do than I talk about God's glory. Or how often that even in my adulthood, can be disobedient to my parents in ways that are different now as an adult, but still dishonoring to them as my parent. And that was a hard, <laughs> that was a hard lesson to do, is to sit back and say that each one of those things could be me. Each one of those things are me at different times. And unfortunately, that is our church. All right, I'm not saying that as a condemnation that we each and every single one of us, but we all have that innate possibility within our heart, right? If we're honest with ourselves. And so that leads us really to this, to another part of what he tells us to watch out for is that it's not just to watch out for the actions, but it's to watch out for the people that are described in living out these actions. He says that they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. So the people who live like this, they can act religious. They can come to church every Sunday and they can put on a pretty face and they can put on their Sunday best and they can sing all the songs and they can even pull you aside and pray with you. But they are sheep in wolves' clothing. They're like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Christian. In other words, 
the people who he is warning against are not external enemies of the church. They're not the people who are openly critical or antagonistic against the name of Christ. No, the people that he's warning against, these people are in the church. They are those who claim to be a Christian, but haven't truly given their life over to Jesus. There are people who have made a really bad trade. They're the ones who say, you know what, I will take all the external appearances of the Christian life instead of really claiming the most important part, which is the, the inward union with Jesus Christ himself. So these are people who will look the part, they will talk the part, they will even act the part, but they do not embrace the part. And some of our translations, and even the NIV that I read earlier, say that they have a form of godliness, but they're denying its power. And it seems to me what it's saying here is that a person like this someone who is denying the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one who lives within us. He indwells us. He is the one who convicts us of our sin. He's the one who fills us and gives us power to live a holy and righteous life. And so anyone who knows and understands the role of the Holy Spirit in their life would know that he is the power, he is the one who can make us a godly person. And naturally, anyone who rejects the Holy Spirit in their life would continue to live a life that reflects the sins listed in that passage. They run the risk by rejecting the Holy Spirit They run the risk of living a life that is just a false Christianity. Just the facade of Christianity without the true life change that's a part of it. And if if those are the people that are are living like this, if those are the people that are going to lead us to difficult and hard times, what should we do? Well, Paul says, stay away from people like that. He says to avoid them. And, and I, I find this interesting because there's, there's some wisdom, there's some discernment that, that needs to happen here because just in that previous chapter, chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, if you want to flip there real quick or just glance your eyes over into the other column on your Bible, Paul tells Timothy, those who oppose him being the, the Lord's servant, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So on, in one chapter he says, you know, you need to instruct people who oppose you And then the very next chapter, he says, you need to avoid those people. And there's a discernment here. And I think really the key thing is, what is that person doing? How is that person responding to when it comes to understanding the power that they have living within them? Are they rejecting the power that is within them? Are they rejecting the Holy Spirit? And if they're doing that, you need to avoid them. But if there's somebody who is maybe living this way or that is opposing the truth, but they understand that the Holy Spirit is there and gives wisdom and discernment and guidance and they're open to hearing and understanding the truth even more, then gently instruct them and help them understand in hopes that they will repent and turn and live in that power. So 
So we need to watch out. We need to watch out for this behavior that is in us and is in our church and that we need to watch out for those people because if they're rejecting the Holy Spirit, then we need to avoid them. So then the next thing that Paul says here is that we need to protect the vulnerable. Now, okay, there's no explicit exhortation here in the passage that actually says protect the vulnerable, uh, but it's certainly implied here. And it says this. It says, they are the kind who work their way into people's homes, they being the people who are living this evil way, these evil men who are uh, living in sin like this and promoting these sins. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever like new teachings, but they are never able to understand the truth. So these wicked people who love themselves, they love money, they love pleasure, they worm their way into people's homes and take advantage of vulnerable women. You know, when I read these verses, I kind of think of the little old ladies who love Jesus, who are are watching, you know, Christian TV, and they're taken in by some televangelist, and they, they write off a check that gives away their entire retirement and life savings and, and you know that 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 brill cream profit ends up using that money to go buy themselves a new jet but Paul's not intending to be condescending toward women here in fact he's addressing a very real problem that is going on in the church of Ephesus and you can go back and look at the book of first Timothy in chapter 5 where the issue of caring for widows is addressed. And we don't have time to, to fully explain the context of the problem there. But it is clear from that passage, 1 Timothy 5, that there were widows in the church of various ages, both young and old. And, and there was a question of who is going to provide for these women? Is it their church family? Is it their family? Should they be providing for themselves? Should should they the women remarry? And for the younger women, especially, there was the question of how should they handle their own sexual desires that they still had, being widowed at a young age. And so there's a lot of confusion going on in the church and how they should respond to these situations. And then you add to that the false teaching that is present in the church that the resurrection has already happened and and, and that marriage should be forbidden. And all of these things together make these women more vulnerable to the influence of some smooth-talking charlatan. It makes them more vulnerable uh, to someone who's going to be willing to give them time and attention and who will play into their hopes or fears or desires and use them for their own pleasure and gratification. So Paul says that we need to watch out because these women are being taken advantage of. And it's implied there then that there are people who are vulnerable then we as the church need to be aware of that and help protect them. I would say that the reason that when we look at this, we can see that we all need to see how it applies to the whole of us is that there's three indicators of what their vulnerability is. And the first one there is that they are burdened with the guilt of sin. 
you know, and we've all experienced this, that, that one bad choice leads to another bad choice. And that those of us who have found ourselves living in sin often find ourselves making other sinful choices in other areas of life as well. And so these vulnerable women are burdened with the guilt of sin. At the same time, they're controlled by various desires, whether it's a sexual or emotional, or whether it's their, their greed, like these other evil men. Or maybe it's their wish to be seen as more religious or holy than they really are. These are all things that any one of us can relate to. And the third thing that, that's an indicator of their vulnerability is that they're chasing after different teachings but are not able to discern the truth. You know, they're, they're looking for some truth to hold on to, but they're not able to discern what it is. You know, I've heard it said that the problem with an open mind is that there's always somebody who's willing to fill it for you. And these vulnerable women, maybe out of a good heart, are looking for something. And these wicked people are coming in and filling their open minds. But these vulnerable people aren't able to discern and understand the truth. And there is people, there are people in this room and all of us are there at one time or another where we are vulnerable because of these very things. Whether it's because of sin in our own life or whether it's because we are being controlled by some desire or some motive in there. Or whether it's because we just don't know what the truth is. We're unable to understand and so we go looking for something and then you know, we find it on... You know, NPR, and all of a sudden this is the trajectory we take for our life. And we all are vulnerable in different ways and at different times. And certainly here at the Church of Ephesus, these women were the vulnerable ones that these wicked and evil men were taken advantage of. And so... Paul says, don't be surprised. Watch out and protect their vulnerable. And at least the very last point, Paul says, don't worry. And don't worry is one of those, those common themes that you'll, you, you hear in this. Because, like I said, this is already the fifth time he's talking about some difficult, hard times that, that they're going to be facing, but with each one, he's like, God's purposes are going to succeed. You need to be ready for it, but it'll be okay in the end. So here in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, he says, these teachers oppose the truth just as Janus and Jambres oppose M Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith. But they won't get away with this for long. Someday, everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as they did with Janus and Jambres. So he pulls up an old example from, from the Old Testament. Now these two men, you're not going to find their names anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, they're the traditional names given to the magicians in Pharaoh's court who served to advance a lie by attempting to replicate the miracles that God gave Moses. And you'd find that in Exodus chapter 7. But the only thing that these magicians of Pharaoh were able to do was they succeeded in helping to harden Pharaoh's heart against the truth of God. You know, tradition also holds 
that these men pretended to convert it to Judaism in order to subvert Moses' attempt to free the Israelites from Egypt. Jewish tradition says that they were the ones who convinced Aaron, Moses' brother, to make the golden calf while Moses was up on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments. And that they were the ones, along with all the other idolaters who were were punished by being put to death for their sin and their idolatry. So Paul uses the example of these men takes a story that, they're fami- that the, the, they would be familiar with and says, yeah, those people, they did some bad things. They actually succeeded in, in replicating the truth twice, right? If you remember the story from Exodus 7, when Moses and Aaron threw down the, Moses' rod and turned it into a serpent, Pharaoh's magicians were like, yeah, we could do that. And they threw down their rods and it became a serpent as well. And then when Moses turned the Nile River into blood, like, yeah, yeah, we can do that too. So they succeeded in, in having this appearance of power But then eventually it came to a point or as the other plagues came upon Egypt, they weren't able to replicate those things. That they were exposed for the frauds that they were. And weren't able to to continue, continue on in their falsehood in their lives. So Paul says that these people, these evil men who are, who are doing these wicked things have a depraved mind. They know the truth, but they don't do it. They twist it, and they find delight in twisting it. And as it relates to their faith, they're counterfeit. They're disqualified. And so the encouraging thing here for Timothy and, this, and the encouraging thing for you and I is that Paul says that their folly will become evident for everyone to see. You see, someday everyone will recognize the kind of fools that they are. See, within the church... Evil men may succeed in drawing people away from the faith. But ultimately, they will never thwart the purposes of the church. And so you and I need to remember that there's no need to be surprised when when hard times come. We just need to be ready for it. And we need to know what to watch out for. We need to be able to protect those among us who are vulnerable so that they don't fall prey to these wicked things. And then ultimately we need to remember that there's no need to worry because we win in the end. God's purposes will always be accomplished even in spite of the wicked things around us. Pray with me, and then Grayson's going to come up and close us with the last song. Father, you are good to us. And God, it is true. We know, we, we recognize the times that we live in. We see all these things all around us. These these sins and these vices. And unfortunately, God, we see these things even within our own hearts. And so, God, I pray that that your spirit would convict us, that we would be grieved by these things so that we can live out your purposes and your calling. Help us as a church to be ever mindful, to care for those around us, 
to not be so self-centered that we forget those who are vulnerable. Help us to protect them. And God, thank you that, that we do win in the end, that we don't need to worry. And in spite of everything else, and you will carry out your purposes, both in our life and in the church and in this world. And we pray all this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.